Ancestor's Legacy is a real-time strategy game which released on Windows in 2018 and onto the PS4 and Xbox One in August of 2019. It releases on the Nintendo Switch this week, joining a fairly small band of RTS games on the console. Can its shield bearers help bring it victory? I'm Glenn Bolger, thank you to the publishing team for the review code, and now, let's find out. Ancestor's Legacy is set in the Middle Ages, and its campaign mode focuses on four factions, the Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, German and the Slav. The stages in the game are inspired or influenced by real historical events, according to the advertising campaign, although I think it would be fair to insert the word loosely into that sentence. First up there is the campaign mode then, which is separated into a number of lengthy chapters spread across those four factions, starting with the Vikings. The early part of the campaign serves as a tutorial, with new mechanics such as combat, stealth, raiding and base building introduced over a number of comprehensive missions, before you are let loose to use all of these new skills across the rest of the campaign. Upon completing the tutorial missions, of which I think there were four, and they took me a good few hours, all of the other factions missions become unlocked and you can play as these as you wish. Combat is a major part of the game right from the off and you will have access to a number of different units as you progress further in. You will begin with basic units such as spearmen, shield bearers and archers before new units such as scouts are introduced and each of the factions will have their own slight variation of these basic unit types. A unit's proficiency against other units is dealt with on a rock paper scissors method, with them being particularly strong against one other unit but weak against another. These are displayed on the drop down menu accessible when hovering over a unit and becoming well versed with these will make the tasks ahead much easier. Unit proficiency is not the only tactic you will have to consider when battling though, with other factors such as morale and terrain also having an effect. Attacking from higher ground could give you an advantage, or hiding in long grass in order to carry out a stealth attack are options available to you and may give you the edge during battle. You can attempt to flank the opposition and any such tactic will cause your opponent's morale to drop. It's not ever made explicitly clear what a raise or drop in morale does, whether it boosts or drops unit stats momentarily or just gives a momentum shift in the battle, but ultimately keeping your troops morale high and attempting to weaken your opponents is certainly advised. You can even create a diversion, for example setting a nearby village alight, thus drawing the soldiers attention away from the town that you are attempting to raid and boosting your odds of being successful. Success in battle will see units level up, and you can assign a stat boost to them at this point, plus you will also have hero characters that will join your ranks at times. These are incredibly strong and have abilities that can be used in battle, although usually an objective to the mission is to ensure that they stay alive throughout. Capturing enemy villages will allow you to put the peasants to work, collecting valuable resources such as wood and food, or you can even capture buildings such as mines to collect further resources and upgrade your armour. Once base building has become available, you will be building houses to increase your population, building a barracks to enable you to build melee units, or an archer's base to develop archers, obviously. You can invest resources into technology which will improve certain elements, such as the efficiency of your scouts, for example, or even teach your units new skills. The squad size of each unit feels a little smaller than in some RTSs that I've played, and I didn't feel that I could just brute strength my way through some missions. Tactics such as flanking the opposition or staying in the shadows were essential a lot of the time, and you almost felt more attached to your units because of this. As mentioned, even the initial campaign chapters, whilst effectively serving as tutorials, are very in-depth. The game may be telling you what you need to do and introducing new mechanics to assist you in doing so, but you will still need to carry it out successfully, and in certain missions before base building is introduced, these present a good challenge. It's refreshing to find a game that has established a way to include a comprehensive tutorial that feels like a part of the experience and can still function as a fully fleshed level in its own right. Aside from the campaign, there is the skirmish mode. Here you can set your own win conditions and take on the computer in either a domination or an annihilation battle. Domination sees you start on a set number of points, and each time one of you takes over a village, you will leech points from your opposition. They then need to capture a village themselves to restore equilibrium. The match ends when one player is down to zero. Annihilation is a classic match where you must capture all of your opponent's key buildings to win. You can select from a few difficulty levels for the AI, and this will be where some people spend a huge amount of time, using everything they have learned in the campaign mode and putting it to practice here. It's not all perfect though, there were times where I went up against what looked like a very similar unit type only to be completely obliterated, when all logic and tactical implementation dictated it should have been a closely fought battle, or a couple of times where I felt I had stayed out of my enemy's field of vision only for them to attack me anyway. 
I also had a couple of instances of not being able to progress due to glitches. Once when destroying a building which should have triggered the end of the level only for nothing to happen and the other where my army could not enter an enemy camp as an enemy was stuck in the entrance blocking my path. The game does also save at certain points and you can save your game manually at any time. Thankfully on both of these occasions the game had just auto saved and reloading that save did fix the issue but I would advise saving often just in case. Another disappointment is the lack of any sort of multiplayer. Versions of the game on other consoles featured the opportunity to play skirmish mode online and compete in PvP matches with up to 6 players. This is absent from the Switch version and there is no sort of local multiplayer either. Even something like a LAN mode, whilst not ideal, would have been some sort of compromise and would have played to the Switch's strengths, but single player is all that is available unfortunately. In terms of the controls, an area which console versions of real-time strategy games have always suffered in over the years, Ancestors Legacy does a very admirable job of making things as accessible to the player as possible. To select a unit you can hover over the desired one and press Y, or you can tap Y twice to highlight all units at once. As well as this you can cycle through available units individually with the L and R buttons and pressing X will automatically find your selected unit should you have scrolled away from them for whatever reason. Once you have your selected unit, you can access their skills and moveset either by holding down ZR to bring up a radial wheel with all available actions presented to you, or you can hold down L or R which will have these moves split between them, allowing you to then press one of the face buttons to perform the designated action. For example, holding down L and pressing X will see your unit set up a healing camp, whereas holding down R and pressing X will have that unit retreat from battle. Clicking on a building within your base works in a similar way, with you being able to hold down said R to bring up the command wheel relevant to that building's function. So the barracks command wheel will display all of the available units that you can recruit. You can also call up a radial wheel at any time and select to manage your villages, meaning that you do not have to constantly return to base in order to keep things ticking over. You can even set a waypoint where all newly recruited units will meet you. These are very nice touches. The camera is fixed in place and therefore cannot be rotated, although you can zoom in and out when required by moving the right stick up and down. One minor niggle I had with the camera was I felt it needed to have the option to zoom out just a little bit further. The zoom in was great and allowed you to see what was happening in the heat of battle, but sometimes you just felt a bit claustrophobic and I would have liked to have been able to get a better view of the full surroundings. Gameplay is challenging and deep with a good level of tactical options, albeit sometimes they don't seem as effective as I would have liked, plus those couple of glitches were a potential concern and it scores 16 out of 20. Controls do a very good job of making the use of a controller feel intuitive and whilst there will always be a clunky nature to an RTS on a console, frustration is most certainly kept to a minimum and they score 15 out of 20. Visually the world built in Ancestors Legacy is actually quite an impressive one. The lands look detailed from up close or afar and all of the buildings and villages are sufficiently detailed. Nice touches such as how buildings are put together when you select one to build, add character to proceedings and the battle animations show each separate unit fulfilling their role appropriately. I also liked how the scenes change within each nation's campaign to signify the different time periods. Then there is the dynamic camera which can be activated whilst in battle by clicking in the left stick. This takes you right into the action so you can see each swing of the sword. It's not very practical but it's a fun feature and looks pretty good. There were some oddities such as walking animations of characters when the camera is zoomed out and there is some noticeable popping of environmental features when scanning the lands at times but on the whole the scene is set well. I did though witness a couple of strange glitches such as these levitating enemies which didn't affect the gameplay but were disappointing nonetheless. Plus the screen can get quite cluttered with all of the text boxes that are presented to you, especially in the tutorial stages. In handheld mode things still hold up very well, the text is of a decent size and there isn't the blurriness that you can find in some games whilst playing undocked. Audio is loud, bombastic and foreboding as it should be and it really helps to immerse you in the gameplay. Background noise includes the sound from the mills, animals on the farm and even hearing sermons being read in the churches, but it's all done in quite a clever and subtle way. Sometimes though you would hear sounds that weren't relevant to what you were seeing on the screen and at these times it was a bit of an immersion breaker. Other negatives include hearing the same one liners from your units a bit too often, especially if you are repeating an action such as travelling stealthily from one area of long grass to another. And some of the voice acting is a bit wooden in places but on the whole a good job is done of setting the scene and enhancing the atmosphere. Cutscenes between missions are portrayed with a hand drawn art style and full voice acting or narration and these work very well. 
Graphics set the scene well for the most part and a smooth frame rate makes navigating the lands a pleasure. Some pop in and the occasional bizarre glitch sour things a touch but visual scores 17 out of 20. Audio does its part in also setting the scene and holds up well bar some repetition in one liners and scores 15 out of 20. Times of peace are not for warriors. Ancestors Legacy costs £31.99, €34.99, $39.99 or $49 Australian dollars 99. As I have said, the campaign mode consists of four factions, each with a good number of missions, and the missions do take a good while to complete. There are three difficulty settings to try, plus of course the skirmish mode, which could last some people any number of hours, providing they are happy playing against just the AI. The lack of multiplayer is a hit towards the value section and would really knock my motivation to play skirmish mode as often as I may have otherwise. If you would happily play skirmish mode in one player, then add a couple of extra points on here, but otherwise value scores 13 out of 20. To conclude, Ancestors Legacy gets a lot of things right where other RTS games have slipped up on consoles, its control system works well and its frame rate is much smoother than something like Northgard when that came to the Switch. However, it gets a few things wrong too. The lack of online is frustrating and the glitches which need a reload need to be taken into account. Albeit, I do want to make it clear that there were just two occasions in the many, many hours that I put into this game. I enjoyed the campaign mode and liked how it was split up across the nations, plus I also liked how the tutorial levels managed to feel like a challenge, so the early part of the game was never a chore. If you can look past a few flaws, this is a very competent RTS. Just make sure you save often. Ancestors Legacy gets a switch up score of 76%. Thank you as always everybody for watching, I hope you enjoyed that review, please do remember to leave a like if you did. A big thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support, and to each and every one of you for watching our videos. Take care, stay safe, and until next time, happy gaming. All done, glad to attacking us! Enemy. They must have some more units nearby. Spears under attack!